Welcome to the Jamestown First Baptist Church Worship Hour. Established in 1930, the First Baptist Church has been instrumental in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ across the Cumberland Mountains. An aggressive local missions program has assisted in establishing sister churches in Fentress County, the Pickett State Park area, and Morgan County. With programs to minister to the individual and the family, we invite you to join with us in our live worship service. Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the services here at First Baptist Church, and we're glad that you're here. Those that uh, felt led not to come and are staying at home, uh, we hope that you have a worshipful experience with us watching by television or listening by radio. And uh, we have a message to all First Baptist members and guests from Mike Ledbetter to the chairman of the deacons. Gary Mullins, our youth director and music uh, corps and director, and Bill Tant, the chairman of security. Beginning this Sunday, we ask if you feel ill in any way, fever, sneezing, coughing, respiratory symptoms, that you please stay home and watch the services on uh, Comcast Channel 12, Twin Lakes Channel 953, or Jamestown First Baptist Facebook page, or listen, or listen on the WDB AM and FM radio. Effective immediately, we're not going to have children's church and all children and youth activities are suspended until further notice. So, uh, make sure there's nothing else. Uh, Sunday night services and Wednesday night services will begin at 6 p.m. We'll continue as normal with all meeting in the sanctuary only. A decision will be made as to next week's Sunday school and welcome center activity on the first of the week. And you'll be notified at that time. So... Uh, we will keep you abreast. Uh, there, there's a lot of, of uh, turmoil and people out there that are, that are sick, and there's a lot of people that are uh, uh, nervous and scared, and we want to uh, have peace and know that God is in control. And, uh, and God is in, He knows all about all this before it ever happened, and we need to trust in Him. And the president has declared today a national day of prayer. And so we're going to spend a few minutes and have some special prayer. And uh, uh, Dr. Mark is going to come and, and we're going to, I'm going to ask him if he will pray. Uh, we, he has talked earlier for the people that are, that are sick and the people that are having to treat the sick. Uh, the people at the hospital, uh, there, there's a lot of turmoil going on. I'm sure they are, have fears and, and, Thanks, and I, it's no sense. And I'm going to let Dr. Mark, if he would come and lead us in a in a time of prayer for that, and then we will have other prayer as the service goes on. God knew, and He has elected us to be here at this time. And um, we have fear, but we're not supposed to have fear of where we're going to end up. I I have a little fear of uh, all the stuff we're going to do in the next two months. Um, but um, I think the front line is going to be in Cookville and Crossville, at least for us, uh, as far as that. And uh, uh, I think we just should pray for our, uh, our health care workers. Uh, in Ruhan, 14% of the people that got sick were health care workers. And, uh, but we, we chose this and have been elected to be there. And so I want to pray for that. I also want to pray for our seniors because I know there's a lot of fear out there about what's going on. Fear is not from God. Right. And that's what we need to replace in our lives is, yes, there are things that are going to happen. And yes, we're going to have to do some hard things and hard decisions will have to be made. But fear is not from God. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you that before all this started, you knew. Before we were born, you knew. And God, that you have prepared us for this time. 
God, don't let us use this as a time to be overwhelmed by fear and those things that come from Satan, but allow us to enter into the battle in a powerful and mighty fillet and to hold up your standard, Lord. And may they not say that we shrunk away from the battle, but that we entered it without fear because you were with us. And God, we are all anxious about how it will come out and what will happen and where we will go. And God, we would ask that you just stop it at the gates and not let it come. But if not, Lord, we ask that you walk with us, that you overwhelm us, that you gird our loins, that you protect us, so that in the end we may glorify you by our actions. Lord, I ask you to be with the people that are on the front lines even more than me, Lord, that they would uh, hold up and that they would not be fearful and they would show the compassion that you have called them to show in the trenches, Lord, that you would use this as a time for them to glorify you with their lives. God, for our uh, seniors and all the people that are risked, Lord, I just ask that you give them a peace, that you protect them, Lord. And, you know, I ask that you protect my family and the seniors that are in my family, Lord, that you would walk with them and you would guide them and use this as a time for them to grow in deeper faith and not use this time as a time to shrink away but a time to engage in you, to get on their knees and to pray. God, we know that's what this truly is. It's a call for us to walk with you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Just a few announcements to go over. I don't know. I'm assuming your trip is, is canceled. Okay. Anyway, so... Uh, Brother Gary was leaving today right after the worship service with the young people, and that has been canceled. So I just wanted to make sure. Uh, the, uh, Annie Armstrong offering, our church has set our goal at uh, $5,000. And so uh, it's, that runs from March 1st through April the 26th. And that, is, that money is used for the North American missions. And so our goal is $5,000. And anybody that would like to participate and give to the Annie Armstrong offering, you uh, make sure that you do, do that. Uh, again, if we continue to do the fellowship time before Sunday school, we're asking everybody to not make anything homemade or bring anything that it's all bought and it's wrapped and that way that will possibly may cut down on some things to be for for the the virus and so again uh we want to uh remind you of that again faith baptist tabernacle and i know the fisher men's class are making uh they're donating uh, the faith baptist tabernacle they had two families uh uh Bethany Smith Ragsdale, and that's the daughter of Russell and Jane Smith, and Darren Crockett, son of Bill and Janet Crockett. They lost their homes and all their possessions. So the Bank of Putnam County, uh, the, I mean, they're taking up money. The Bank of Putnam County is taking up donation, and the Fishers of Men class here in our church are taking up uh, donations and supplies or whatever. If you feel like giving to that, uh, please do so. Again, uh, Operation Christmas Child that continues to uh, go on. Again, there's little medicine bottles in each of the Sunday school rooms, and that will hold quarters, and it'll hold nine dollars worth of them. And that's what it costs to mail one of the shoe boxes that we send, and when they send them out to uh, uh, to go for our uh, uh, when we mail the boxes this coming November. Uh, there's been other people in our church that are experiencing uh, uh, times of, of loss and grief. Uh, we need to continue to pray for uh, the Bobby Neal family and the death, his death this last week. Uh, we need to pray for other sick people. We need to pray for uh, Brandy Tompkins. We need to pray for uh, Ray Owens. Ray's not feeling well today. And I'm sure there's other people that I don't know about, but I know those three. So I'm going to have another prayer. Can't pray too much, can we? No. So anyway, we're going to. I'm going to pray again. And uh, Gary, if we have to shorten the song, maybe that'd be all right. Uh, if we if, 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 if we need to pray, but uh, and then I ask you to continue to pray for the pastor search committee. We have uh, started talking to some uh, prospective uh, uh, candidates, and uh, just. 
We're not nowhere. We're, we're not there yet, but we are, uh, are are working at it. And I ask you to continue to pray for the pastor search committee. And as we put in the in the bulletin, I ask you to pray for the pastor that will be our the, the man that will be our next pastor. Pray pray for his wife. Pray for his children. Pray for the past the church that he's coming from because they'll have to go through what we're going through. Uh, and then pray for the pastor search committee that we will have the wisdom and we will listen to God's discernment and we will be on our knees praying and seeking God's will as we go through this time. So at this time, let's, ha let's have another time of prayer uh, for that. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for uh, the love that, you, that you've shown on us. And Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. And Lord, we ask that you uh, lift up these families that are that are struggling right now from death or from sickness. And Lord, I lift up the Bobby Neal family. And Lord, I just ask you to comfort his wife and uh, his grandmother and family and children. And Lord, as they go through this time of, of, uh, of grief. But Lord, we know uh, that we will see Bobby again one day in heaven. And Lord, we, uh, we thank you for that, but we, uh, that's not making it easy for them at this present time. But Lord, we ask that you put your arms of comfort around them. We ask you to be with Brandy uh, and Jason and their children and, and their families as they go through this time of her life. And Lord, we lift up Brandy and, and Lord, only you can, uh, uh, we know that you're, you know exactly what's going on. And, and, and Lord, we know what you're, it's your will to what's done with her life. And we know that you can touch her and heal her if that's your will. And we just ask that you be with, with them as they go through this time. Uh, whatever treatments that they have to go through, that you will give them the strength and the courage to go through that. And we lift that family up to you. I lift up Ray Owens. Ray's my friend. And I, I, not feeling well this morning, I ask you to be with him and Miss Geraldine as they're there at home. And just lead God and direct them in a special way. Just help Ray to get feeling better and to have a good day. And, uh, and Lord, as, as our president has called for a national day of prayer today, Lord, we just ask that you, our whole country would, would, would fall on their knees and they would humble themselves and bow before you. And, Lord, we have so, much thing, so many things going on in the world that we need to look to you for strength and guidance in our life. And it only can come from you. Lord, because you're in total control of the whole world. And Lord, help us to remember that we're just just pawns and, and that you're, you've got everything in control and you knew all this was going to happen before it happened. And you're, you've got it. You, you have a plan. And we just have to, Lord, we just need to trust in you. Lord, as Mark said, Lord, help us not to be uh, in, in fear because fear is not from you. Lord, you want to give us... Uh, uh, happiness and joy and Lord we and we ask that you would give the ones that have to work uh, and and deal with the coronavirus Lord we ask that you give them strength and guidance and and, and extra uh, healthiness and and Lord I just lift everyone up to you Lord we thank you for this church we thank you for everybody that's doing things Lord, we don't know all the answers we don't know what to do Brother Mike is working uh, hard, and the others are trying to make the right decisions for our church to, to where we do so to, uh, to help uh, continue to minister to those here in Fentress County uh, on the Cumberland Plateau. Lord, again, I just thank you for uh, you being with us today. Lord, may we feel your presence. and. And, Lord, we know that you are, in, again, in total control. Lord, I ask you to be with Brother Bill as he brings the message that you would uh, touch his, uh, his, uh, his, his voice and his, his thoughts as he brings his message that we need to hear from you this morning. Again, Lord, be with Brother Gary as he uh, leads us in worship, the choirs they sang. Lord, everybody that's here, again, those that are listening by radio, watching by television, we help, hope that you help them to have a, a worshipful experience. And may they feel the presence of, your, uh, uh, of you in their life today as we go through this, this time. Lord, again, we thank you for loving us. And we thank you for sending Jesus Christ to, to die on the cross for our sins. 
that we can have eternal salvation. And Lord, just lead, guide, and direct us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We are not going to have a uh, uh, offering uh, just to keep the plate from being passed around. There will be someone standing at the door here at the front and one at the back. And when you want, when you leave, you can place your offering in that. Just another thing to do to maybe keep somebody from passing something to uh, that's what they've decided. And so I'm just passing on those words. And so that's how we're going to take up the offer today. And uh, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 7, verse 15 through 20. And it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to, no, the evil I do not want to do. This I will keep on doing. Now, if I do not now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me who does it. And that is the, uh, the scripture that we're, that brother, uh, that brother Bill asked me to read this morning. And so with that, if there are, uh, again, no further announcements, uh, I'm going to turn over to Brother Gary, and we're going to start our, our worship services. We will do the offering at the end of our worship time. Yeah, I just want to reiterate next Sunday morning, if you ever want to bring prepackaged stuff, if you bring anything home cooked, I will be standing at the door and confiscate every bit of it. <laughs> okay, we got an old song. The choir is going to sing. You're going to sing it in a minute, but the choir, this is a song I found a few weeks ago. Glory land is not so far away.
seat. Everyone could see But his destiny was changed As he looked at Christ and said When your kingdom comes Remember me In paradise that day he stood Just like the Lord had said he would Surrounded by those No merits to my name, no works that I can claim. He who brought me told me just to say.
Stronger, the song stronger. <laughs>
and said to them, where is your faith? Because you prayed. Several of you have uh, asked me about my wife. She's under the weather this morning. We went out to eat on Friday night in Knoxville, and evidently uh, she got a hold of something that hadn't agreed with her digestive system, and she's not feeling well this morning. So appreciate your concern, those of you who have asked about her. <clears throat> We're five weeks away from Easter. And normally, I would begin with the Palm Sunday message when Jesus enters on Sunday to the shouts and praises of the people. Uh, as the schedule works out, I'm not going to be able to preach all those messages, so we'll have to skip around just a little bit. But, uh, you know, on Sunday, he enters Jerusalem to the praises of the people, and by Friday, that same group of people, that same crowd is calling out, crucify him, crucify him. On Monday, he comes back to Jerusalem from Bethany. I mean, excuse me, comes back from Bethany to Jerusalem. And there he cleanses the temple. And one of the very few times, perhaps the only time in Scripture, that we see Jesus angry. And he returns again to Bethany, comes back again on Tuesday, uh, 
curses the fig tree on the way into Jerusalem. On Wednesday, the scripture is silent. Evidently, it was a day of rest. He comes back again on Thursday to Jerusalem. On Thursday night, he has the Lord's Supper in the upper room with his disciples. And Judas betrays him. On Friday, he's crucified. He's in the grave on Saturday. And praise the Lord, on Sunday, he comes forth from that grave. And I look forward, I know you do, to Easter Sunday morning as we celebrate the resurrection. But this morning, I want us to look at the event that takes place in the upper room uh, after he has instituted the Lord's Supper. I debated about the titles for this sermon. I first thought about, did the devil really make me do that? Then I thought about, well, why the devil did I do that? I finally settled on, what's wrong with me? And another title I thought of was the ever-present uh, agenda of our adversary. I don't know whether you saw the series on the History Channel as they had a series on the Bible a while back. And I was uh, fascinated by the, uh, their interpretation of of the devil or of Satan as we know him. And there's been a lot of talk and debate over the years about whether or not the devil is exist is really an existing person or entity. Uh, some believe there's not a devil. But if you believe Scripture, if you believe the Bible, and I do, and I know you do too, the devil is a real person. If you go back to Isaiah uh, chapter 14, we read about his origin. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephyr. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Called a morning star, uh, we know him as Satan, we know him as the devil. A falling angel that evidently rebelled against God in heaven and God kicked him out of heaven. But if you look at what the scripture says about the devil, and you study scripture, you realize that the devil answers some of life's questions that perplex us. You ever wonder after you've done something, you say to yourself, why did I do that? Or what's wrong with me? Several years ago, David Brinkley, who was commentator for news, uh, uh, one of the news channels, I believe it was NBC, he asked Ann Landers. Anybody read Ann Landers in the paper? Okay, I know a lot of these ladies do. I enjoy reading her, too, because you find some fascinating questions there and fascinating answers. But Brinkley asked her, he said, you receive about a million letters a year. I can't believe she reads all of them. Surely she has somebody to help her. But anyway, he asked her, is there a common thread that runs through all of those letters? And she quickly answered, the most common question is, what's wrong with me? Nothing new. We read that passage from Romans a few moments ago. The good that I would do, I do not do. Paul argues or uh, reveals to us that he, like us, struggles with behavior that sometimes we don't understand. And sometimes we say to ourselves, why in the world did I do that? You ever say something and as soon as it goes out of your mouth, you, I wish I could take that back. Why did I say what I did? Usually it gets us into an embarrassing situation. Sometimes we hurt somebody's feelings. But whatever the results, we begin to think, why in the world did I say that? Paul said, it's a struggle. It's a battle. There's another question that's often raised. Can the devil make me commit sin? Well, this morning I want us to look at some of these questions. Why did I do that? And what's wrong with me? And can the devil make me sin? And look and see what the scripture says to us about this, our adversary. If you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 
And I want to read two passages from that chapter. The first one begins at verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? So they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, and from then on Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And now we come to Thursday night. He institutes the Lord's Supper there in the upper room. And then we find in verse 26 that Scripture says, When the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad. Began to say to him, one after another, Lord, surely you don't mean me. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then the Jude, and then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Jesus knew who it was going to be. Verse 26. While they were eating... Jesus took bread, when given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, when given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, this very night, he's talking to Peter, you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me or deny me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. First thing I want us to remember, we must acknowledge the reality that we are in a spiritual battle that results in either life or death. Every single one of us must fight that battle. We have no choice. For Satan opposes us and the Lord calls us. And we have a decision to make. And we're going to either win that battle or lose that battle. And it depends upon the choices we make. You see, our adversary Satan is real. The battle is real. And it, and it involves real people. This is not some figment of our imagination. It is not an imaginary battle. It is a real battle common to the human race involving every single person who has ever lived or will live in the future. Our adversary Satan is real. He's not the little man pictured often in comics or in different places, a, a little man with horns and a tail and a pitchfork in his hand. He is a real entity, a real person who opposes us. He's the opposite of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us when we're born again. And that Holy Spirit can enable us to win the battle against the adversary. But never underestimate the strength and the power of the adversary. He is a powerful person. And in our text... Judas and Simon Peter, they're real people involved in a spiritual battle with a real devil. What made me do it? It's an ongoing battle. My granddaughter, Bella, several years ago when we were talking to her one day about her behavior, she said to us, it's so hard to be good all the time. 
from the beginning as a child, that battle goes on, doesn't it? You ever heard about the terrible twos? What's one of the first words a child learns? No. No. That battle begins from almost from the time they're born. And it continues on to the day we die. We have a real adversary. We're in a real battle. And it involves real people. You see, second thing I want you to remember. Satan has an agenda or a game plan. And that game plan is to win the battle. And he has several strategies that he uses against us. Now Judas and Peter are both attacked by the adversary, aren't they? Jesus warns Peter, you'll deny me. In fact, he warns all the disciples. And although Peter's dis, uh, betrayal is more vivid and more detailed in Scripture, in essence, all the disciples betrayed him because when he is crucified... They all go into hiding, don't they? Rather than standing up for what they believe, rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to empower them, when he's crucified, they run and they hide. Now Peter's betrayal is more dramatic, you might say, because he stands by the fire in a public place and denies Jesus three times. But Judas and Peter are both attacked by our adversary, Satan. And here's his strategy. First of all, he tries to dominate us. He tried to dominate Jesus in the wilderness, didn't he? You go back to Luke chapter 4, and after Jesus has fought the battle in the wilderness, where he has been strengthened by the Holy Spirit, he comes back, and the first, place he, the first person he encounters is Satan himself. Remember, he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple, and he asked him to, to jump off. He said, you know, if you're the son of God, you won't get hurt. In essence, I'm paraphrasing. But you must remember this. Every time Jesus answers Satan in that experience, he quotes Scripture. You want to know what the, probably the greatest power you have in resisting the devil? The Scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. If I know the book and Satan comes against me, I can quote scripture to him, can't you? You and I have power. We can say, get behind me, Satan. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can resist the devil. But his strategy is to dominate every man, woman, boy, and girl. And even if we get saved, he then works to keep us from doing the work of the Lord. He tries to dominate us. Second strategy is he deludes us. I think, I believe, that one of the reasons Judas betrayed Jesus comes out of the background that he came from. He was a zealot, Scripture teaches us. Now, a zealot was a part of the underground resistance that had the purpose, their desire, was to overthrow the Roman government. That's the background out of which Judas came from. Dedicated. Guerrilla warfare, we would call it today. If they could harass the Roman government, harass the Roman soldiers in any way possible, their goal was to overthrow the Romans who, who enslaved them. And then Judas began to see that Jesus was not going to be a conquering Messiah. You see, he came to Jesus because he saw the power that Jesus had. And I believe Judas felt like if I can force Jesus and make him take a stand publicly, then he will declare himself the Messiah. But what did Jesus do? He taught by his example, by word and by deed, I have come to be a suffering servant. I'm going to die for the sins of the people. And when Judas realized that he was not going to declare himself as the Messiah that Judas expected, then Judas began to think about, hey, if I can force his hand, if I betray him, that's going to force him to use his power to protect himself. Judas didn't realize 
Jesus was committed to going to the cross. And so he deluded Satan. He deluded Peter. Peter began to doubt as he stood by the fire, didn't he? And he denies the Lord three times. The next strategy that Satan uses against us, if we allow him to dominate us, we allow him to delude us, in the end he'll destroy us. In the end he will destroy us. The opposition to Jesus was led by the religious leaders, wasn't it? They were seeking a reason or means by which they could justify putting him to death. That was their stated goal, wasn't it? We're going to get rid of him. That's why they charged Jesus with blasphemy. And Satan's strategy is always to destroy the truth, to oppose the truth. And here he's trying to oppose the reality that Jesus was and is the Son of God who came to save his people from their sins. Satan sought to destroy both Judas and Simon Peter, and he succeeded in destroying Judas, didn't he? For when Jesus allows himself to be arrested, and Judas realizes what he's done, and I believe Judas came to understand what he had done, he goes and hangs himself. Satan dominated Satan deceived, Satan opposed, and he destroyed Judas. He came close on Simon Peter, didn't he? And we'll look a little in a few moments at what happened to Simon Peter. But there's one more strategy that Satan uses, and I think he is very effective in our day and time in using this. He tries to divide and distract. He tries to divide his people and distract it. Church I pastored years, over 20 years ago, we had a ministry in a halfway house. Joe Johnson Middle Health Center out of Chattanooga came to Pikeville and, and bought a house and brought mental health patients who were not ready to live alone, but they didn't need to be hospitalized in an institution. They formed an advisory board to try to help integrate those people into our community. And one of my members was on that advisory board. And we were picking these people up on our bus. I baptized a couple of them. One of them I baptized. He came down with cancer and died. And I went to Saudi Daisy, Tennessee and preached his funeral. And His folks wrote us a letter about how much they appreciated our church taking him in and and ministering to him. And we had about 15 or 16 people we were picking up on Sunday morning. And they were coming every single Sunday. Well, my member came to me one Monday morning and said, Pastor said, uh, the mental health center is looking for a place to do their counseling. They were busing these people from Pikeville to Dunlap Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I tell you, that's time consuming. And, and our county government had said they were going to donate a piece of land and they were going to build a building for their counseling. But until that time, they wanted to use our fellowship hall. And I thought, that's a good idea. We can minister some more to these people. I took it to the deacons and the deacons were divided. They couldn't come to a conclusion, but they said, we'll take it to the church and business meeting. We took it to business meeting and... Uh, <coughs> Had a motion on the floor of the second to allow them to use it. One of our men spoke up and said, I think we ought to take this vote on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning when more people are present. And I said, well, we have a motion in a second. And Robert's rules of order, and that's not my rules, okay? But uh, that you got a motion in a second, you got to take a vote. And uh, I said, if the person who made the motion is agreeable, we could amend this motion to take the vote on Sunday. And I asked the man who made the motion, he said, that's all right with me. So we amended, the church amended the motion to take the vote on Sunday, the next Sunday. I'm sorry, a week from Sunday because uh, this was Wednesday and we like to give a notice of a week. 
Well, the next Monday, the man who's on the advisory board comes to me and said, Brother Bill, I've been told that if uh, this passes, it's going to cost you your job. What do you want me to do? You want me to withdraw the, the request? And I says, no, Brother Mike. I said, church needs to vote on this. And the Lord took care of me before I came, and he'll take care of me if, if it costs me my job. Brother Mike left the office. Next day I get a phone call, pastors, there's a telephone campaign going on to stop this. And I prayed and thought, and I believe the Lord led me this way. <laughs> I did something I have never done before and I've never done again. Brother Mike, I called a pastor, I mean a deacon and their wives meeting. And brought them all in and told them, now I'm going to speak and you're going to listen and you can speak after I finish. I went around the room and I believe the Lord gave me this. And I had something to say to every person, I love you because. Something they had done for me, something they had done for a church, something they might have done for another member of the church, but I love you because. And then I said, the telephone campaign stops now. Well, folks, scheduled for Sunday morning. On Friday, Brother Mike comes to me and said, I had a call from the president of the mental health center in, in Chattanooga. They're withdrawing their request. I called the president and I said, I wish you'd let this come to a vote. It needs to be voted on. We've got an opportunity to minister. He said, no. Under the circumstances, even the church votes to allow us to use the fellowship hall, we will not come. On Sunday, that following Sunday, all of those people that we had been picking up were at the Church of Christ, and we lost that ministry. Satan divided and distracted our church, and we lost that ministry. He loves to come in. I think that's one of the places he works the most often. I've seen churches get upset over whether or not we're going to have a piano or where that piano is going to be. I've seen churches arguing over what kind of music we're going to have. Or who's going to, you know, are guitars and drums allowed in the church? Brother Gary, you've probably seen some of that in your ministry. Satan loves to divide and distract the church and to rob her of her witness in the community. And his, finally, his plan is always to distort the message of God. Always. Two principles here. Remember, write it down. Put it in your memory. Never underestimate the power of Satan, our adversary. Judas and Simon both did. I would have never thought our church would have done what they did in that ministry. Now think about this when it comes to Judas and Peter. Both of them had watched Jesus perform miracles. Both of them had seen him give life and call Lazarus from the grave. Both of them had listened to his teachings. Both of them had seen the power of prayer. But still they failed Jesus. No person is immune to the wiles of the devil. If we don't spray, stay prayed up and read up and committed, he'll pull us down too. He constantly tempts us. The second principle, Satan never sleeps, folks. Never gives up. Peter says in his letter, he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
And he wants to devour a lost person and he wants to devour a Christian by making that Christian unusable and unfaithful to his Lord or her Lord. He constantly tempts us. He lies to us. He suggests to us. He perverts the truth. He blinds us. He deceives us. And if we're not on guard, he's going to get us. And if he can't keep us from being saved, he will try to keep us from being useful to God. There's a strategic progression here that leads to certain victory for Satan. If, as I said, if we don't stay prayed up, read up, and trusting only in Jesus. Scripture says that he infiltrated, that he entered into Judas. And that infiltration was over a period of time. Now let me say at this point. He cannot enter you or I unless we allow him to. We have, Scripture says, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. I've got Jesus and his Holy Spirit in my life. If I'm listening to him, if I'm read up, if I'm prayed up, and I'm committed up, he can't be in control of me. He cannot dominate you. He cannot control you unless you allow him to. You see, Judas began a downward spiral there when he tried to achieve his own purpose. Judas had an agenda. I'm going to get rid of the Roman government. I'm going to use this man to help me and my group get rid of the Romans. And when he began to think about that and to deal with that, he began to move to a point in which Satan would infiltrate him or come into him and deceive him. Now you remember, the devil cannot make you sin. You are responsible for your sin. You are responsible for your cho choices. But he always comes, tries to infiltrate us, de deceive us, get our consent, and then he takes charge and produce the action that he wants. The action that, and results that he wants. Let me use an example that we see often in our society, in our world. I don't believe that very often any husband or wife sets out deliberately to be unfaithful. There might be a few instances. I don't believe many husbands get up on a Monday morning and say, I'm going to be unfaithful to my wife tonight. Likewise, a, a, a wife. But what happens? It begins inch by inch. There's attraction. Then there's flirtation. And then there's deception that results in betrayal. At any point in time, that person, the woman or the male, can move back and away. But the final step is deception. Deception. Never underestimate his sacred. If we don't turn to the power of the Holy Spirit, destruction and ruin are inevitable and they're non-reversible. Now, he can forgive anything God does. And if we come to ourselves as the prodigal son that we talked about last Sunday, he will forgive. If we repent as King David did in the situation with Bathsheba, he will forgive. If we return to our first love, Jesus Christ, and remain committed to him, he will forgive. We can be restored if we turn back to him. Judas was destroyed. Simon Peter was restored. Think about it. We won't take time to read the scripture. John chapter 21 tells us about Jesus finding the men out fishing. Remember Peter said, I'm going to fish and the rest of them said we're going. I think there's a real possibility Peter was going back to his old, old vocation, okay? But they look on the shore and there's Jesus. 
And they come ashore, and he's prepared a meal for them, and they eat the fish. And he says to Simon Peter, do you love me? And Simon Peter says, I love you. He says, feed my lambs. Three times he says to Peter, do you love me? And he says, tend my sheep. And he restores Simon Peter. And puts him back on the road. And he become, Peter becomes one of the pillars of the church. And writes two letters in the New Testament, first and second Peter. Can you even comprehend what a blessing it would be to be allowed to write scripture? To have the privilege of writing scripture is restored. I love the old hymn, and we'll sing it in just a moment. I will arise and go to Jesus. I will embrace Him in my arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. Do you need to arise this morning? Let's stand together, Brother Gary, and come to Jesus. Do you need to return and defeat Satan in your life? Will you come as we sing? Come ye sinners poor and weak Weak and wounded sick and sore Jesus ready stands to save you All of pity, love and power I will Pray. Heavenly Father, we just love you today, Lord. And just thank you. Thank you for the day you've given us. This is the day that you have made, Lord. We have so many requests on our hearts. You know our hearts, Lord. You know our requests. Please just watch over us, protect us, keep us safe, Lord. But let us continue to work for you, continue to serve you, and continue to serve the kingdom in everything we do. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Amen.